All right. How y'all doing? Well, I'm not a disaster. I'm a walking disaster. Personally. You're here. You're awake. <laughs> We're awake. Awake. How about we just like be happy with? Yeah. Right. Just. We have. Have you seen Have you seen the videos on Instagram where they take all of the clips of Macho Man Randy Savage yeah. saying, "Have a cup of coffee." Oh yeah. Right. I want to do one of those about this class because if there's one perk of this class, it's you get to have a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so Henchy Color Studies. This guy, Henry Henchy, Henry Henchy, Charles Henchy, Charles Henchy, Charles Henchy. Um, he was he was part of the Cape Cod School, and so like I want to just kind of preface like where we're going, and then the way of kind of like approaching this thing. So it's very much a color mixing class through painting so it's like so we'll start with really simple forms and then we'll get to some anatomical forms my thought is to do some geometric forms with basically primary color influence and then do some more geometric forms with some secondary influence and then do some like anatomical forms i've have i have those david casts of like the eye and the ear and the nose and all that kind of stuff and so we can have those get influenced by color. So you see more organic shapes drawn through color. And then, and then towards the end of the, the term or whatever, we'll have more like kind of a, a blend of those things. Some, some objects are actually colorful, some are not. We're gonna move from like the white objects being influenced by color into like colored objects. All right, um, for this, um, for today, I'm going to demo and focus on just using the primary colors, and I want to preface a way of mixing, a, a kind of like a, a way of understanding your palette using something called subtractive color theory. Is that, oh, this is, just is this familiar to anybody? Is this new? Yeah, we were just Good. talking about that. Good. Um, so the premise of this is that you can kind of, I, and, and I should preface this, what this doesn't focus on is it doesn't focus on the inherent value that specific pigments have. So we, a lot of times, just in the nature of our mammalic vision, is that the word? <laughs> in the nature of our mammalic vision, we have we think of things in terms of color and we think of things in terms of contrast, but we don't often equate that, that these have rather different values from grayscale standpoint and that these colors have a way different value grayscale standpoint than something like blue. So if we... Um, it's, hey, Mary. It's like a short range, right? Um, yeah, scale, it's, it? well, it's a, it's a, it's a trained way of seeing where it's more important for us to see like green or red to see if somebody is ill or bleeding as opposed to like saying like, wow, that blood that's coming out of the wound is like value four, but the blood that's drying is more like value six and a half. So, so it's like a. So it, it's it's a, a it's a visual. sense well it's a sensitivity to chroma over value so it's like a a deprioritization of value in our day to day right. existence. Yeah. Because when we talk about value, like <coughs> the, the the range of the value of a color. Uh, yeah. So it would either so be the I absorption or reflection of light. So when I yeah. when I talk about red and yellow, do I say that? Um, that's red ties, I'm just reaching for language, like a broader range, because if I am... I hear what you're saying. Okay. And, that some, and that some colors might have more natural local values, depending on pigment or depending on mixture. Or, yeah. Um, um, or like, um, if I add, if water is a variable that changes the value of the color 
in watercolor, then that red, I can I can bring it down to a you know the lightest light, and I can take it to the darkest dark straight off the tube. So it has this value range. Yeah, and that so some of that has to do with like pigment opacity, I would say. So that's, um, that's related to yeah because I'm. Because you're dispersing it, yeah. So and so this is that actually this is. Let me get to this, and and that'll 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 say exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so like if I was to look at these colors just naturally, then we're gonna run into a scenario where yellow has a very high or low value, whether you're talking about it from like atelier value standpoint, or whether you're talking about it as in terms of like light absorbed, light reflected. I've heard this as a value two, and I've heard this as a value seven. <laughs> so it's where, like, where is it a value two versus a value seven? I just, I don't just, know. just different <laughs> schools of thought describe it in different. Like it's a flip. It's right. A flip. So, so I'm just asking, <laughs> yeah. which just, is what? Like, is the atelier the two or is the atelier the seven? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like it really, it really var, it really varies from school to school. So okay. it's like, we'll say that. Yellow, this this particular yellow, whether it's like Hansa light or Cad yellow light, Cad lemon, those kind of colors, right. is going to have a very light gray, high value gray. Right. Um, something like like a cadmium red medium or naphthol red. We often think of these colors as being darker than they actually are. We usually respond to chroma in a darkening kind of way, um, and. And so the tendency is to want to put it somewhere up here, but by putting it on a grayscale, I can see that it's like putting bleach on the t-shirt. So I just kind of keep going down until I find the spot where I now have sort of the proper value range there. So Ken Goshen said that in photography, the scale is flipped. Yeah. And it, it has... Yeah, that yeah, and by and large, that's the the consensus. There are some, like, there are some schools that talk about it as as um, darker values being lower and lighter values being higher. And then there's some schools, particularly when it pertains to like Munsell kind of color theory, um, that think of it in terms of light spectrum, and they sometimes will have the value scale inverted, inverted as well. So it's like it it you, you are so correct in that away. it's like pick, pick away. yeah, and pick away and be consistent with it. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Um and then a color like this has a really deep value, but it's when it comes to like transparency, you can kind of get like when you have more transparent colors, you have like a little bit of range where you can do it thicker or thinner. And just by dispersing the pigment a little bit more, you can lighten the color up considerably. You can actually, you won't ever get to the point where it's super light without white, but you can you can start like this probably sits maybe somewhere, somewhere in here. Um, but you can you can play with the natural qualities of pigments being either more transparent or more opaque. But I like using these three colors because what I what ends up happening, let me pull out my fancy bag of tricks here. Is that a seven point scale? This one here I have as an eight point eight. scale. So then you have a you have two mids, two lows, and two highs. Mm -hmm. And then you have white and black. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the nine point scale is really nice because you can get a true middle value and then you can dissect the middle value on the light side and the middle value on the dark side. So I can go one, nine, I can get five. I can get seven just by averaging those two out. I can get three by averaging those two out. And then I can split the difference in between those. So from a mixing standpoint, nine is a very practical kind of approach. Um, but if I was to think about just thinking about this in terms of chroma. So this subtractive color theory process is not going to describe the value associated with colors. It's purely like, 
how much more yellow or blue or red is a color to another color. And, and in this case, what I end up focusing on to, to begin with is that these are the, from a pigment standpoint, a cadmium red. In this case, I have Williamsburg or equivalent in terms of pigment. E A, um, whoopsies, a Hansa yellow light or cadmium yellow light and an ultramarine blue. Cobalt is awfully close to this, but it's just not quite um, the same. It, it leans, cobalt leans a little more uh, yellow, a little more green than ultramarine blue does, but they're pretty damn close. Um, these, yeah, this is ultramarine. And what this is, is that if I take any given palette, and in this case, before I get totally into this, the nice thing about these colors is that when you mix them together, um, sort of a la Bogdan from CC, you can hone in on a color that looks awfully purple. Um, and it will, with white, will start to neutralize out to a, um, a gray, a neutral gray. So with these primary colors, you can neutralize down, and that's going to give us sort of the center of this scale. So I can look at this and go, OK, does that gray lean any particular way? It leans a little violet heavy, so I'll neutralize it back down with some, you know, with the neutralizer. And this is kind of the weird thing about this gray is just on its own, it's, it's technically a chromatic gray. It doesn't really look chromatic gray. It sits a tiny bit lighter than the blue because we've naturally lightened things down with those other colors. Um, but I can get a gray that now is like rather achromatic. This particular color, and I'm making kind of a large batch of this because I'm just going to keep this here if people want to swipe away at it and use it instead of spending a bunch of time in paint mixing it. It gives us the center of this chroma scale. And if I have these three colors on my palette, I'm not going to consider white a color, but when I mix color, I tend to think of white as a blue. <coughs> Because when you thin it out and glaze it down, it optically goes blue. Um, same with black, but just to a lesser degree. Um, I have titanium, titanium. today, okay. um, so I can. Yes. Yeah, so now I can. Yeah, <laughs> in <case> <laughs> yeah. In case I'm hungry later. Um, if this is my palette, then in the scheme of color mixing, these are all single pigment palettes. I have subtracted the range of chroma down to this triangle. So in any given, um, hey, do you have some cat orange on your palette? Cat orange, yeah. yes. So in any given color, um, yeah, it's close enough. Um, in any given color mixture, I find, thank you, thank you. I can, like if I wanted to mix down to a secondary color, and this is a circumstance where I start thinking a little bit about the product I'm either making or buying. So I prefer to buy like single pigment tubes of color. Every company <coughs> should have at least some kind of numbers on the back. So even if you don't know what the numbers are, there should be something where it's like, 
pigment yellow, 53, or you know, that kind of thing. Um, I like getting single pigment because it's like, okay, these are as, it's all the same. There's no optical mixing happening. We do that in painting a lot, but it's like, there's no, it's, they're all the same pigment particles in that mix. So if I think of it as like bricks and mortar, it's like they're all the same color bricks. So when I mix a secondary color, I now have a two color orange in this instance. And if this orange isn't orangey enough, it's not Gojo can enough or whatever I need it to be, I can either key the rest of my painting towards the blue so that this appears more chromatic or I need to move to a single pigment orange. But it, it actually even still shows the point. Yeah. Um, right, so, so this happens with every color here where I can see now that the, the maximum range on the chromatic scale, like I'm not going to get a good red violet with this. I need alizarin, I need dioxazine purple, I need, some, you know, I need something, I need quinacridone red, I need something that will stretch the range of this towards violet or towards green or towards orange or I just work the, the range on the inside. And we're all really familiar with a lot of the colors on the inside where it's like if we were to go to, you know, let's say I want, um, I want something like yellow ochre. I can find it in this palette. Two yellow, tiny bit of green. All right, I can find something like that. Get some of that grime out of there. Yeah, it's, it already exists there. If I want, right, same thing, if I want burnt sienna, it's like I can probably take some of this gray. It's more of a red. Then I start seeing colors in terms of their qualities as opposed to the names, where it's like burnt sienna is kind of a red, orange, brown. So it's probably something like that. There are charts like Todd Casey and Michael Aviano and some painters like that have really good charts of like specifically plotting these colors on the spectrum of where they exist, like pigment colors, where they exist around the wheel and then like how neutral to chromatic they are. So this is like approximate. This is fairly accurate. <laughs> this is approximate, right? Um, uh, Todd Casey, C-A-S-E-Y, Michael Aviano, A-V-I-A-N-O. That guy, I think he's like 100 now, 90, 95. Um, but I, so I can find these colors where it's like I either can mix down to it or I can have that tube color as an alternative to that as well. Like it's, as long as I understand that yellow ochre is in this palette, even if I don't have yellow ochre pigment, the, the chromatic effect exists there, right? But if I wanted like Viridian, it's like it's, it ain't in there. You know, if I want, you know, if I want Barney, Barney doesn't exist on here. You know, I got to go outside the palette for it. Um, so in terms of where we're going with this today, what I'd like us to focus on is that the nice thing about having a really um, simplistic kind of shape form is that we can be really drawing with the brush. So from a um, logistical standpoint, I like, I, I've really adopted this philosophy of like dissolves like. So the best thing to thin your, thin, thin's a, a, a controversial word, but the best way to loosen your paint up in oil is to just use oil and then you don't have to use solvent and things like that. But it's very easy then to um, focus on trying to like draw lightly, very simple forms where I can 
treat it just like I would treat it a piece of charcoal or something like that. I can wipe this down, I can scrape it down, and then I can paint right over it. It's not going to really affect it. In the, in the scheme of, say, like a henchy approach to painting, we're going to focus on finding big, simple value shapes. And in this case, I kind of like the idea of finding a color through some really hard kind of like value labor and then um, drawing it down to the value that's supposed to be. And then if it needs to change in terms of chroma, so it's like, I'm gonna try and process this, find a color. I'm gonna reverse engineer how I typically mix because this is how you would kind of approach this. Find a color, bring it down to the value and then adjust its chroma through gray in this case, or through a tonal mixture of complement or sub-complement. Can you say that one more time? Find color, bring it to the value, then? Then adjust its chroma. Right, so in this case, like let's say I was gonna, let's say I was gonna do something like this right in here. I see that as kind of a yellow, yellow orange. So it's like in this case, I kind of already mixed that color when I squint at it, it's, it's pretty dark. So I have to kind of darken this. In this case, I'm gonna try and use some of this chromatic gray to like darken this down. <coughs> because the chromatic gray is, is if, it's, if it's mixed pretty darn neutral, it will tend to not shift the color very much. If it shifts the color somewhere, it's like this is going a little green for my taste. I can bring in some of the yellow to bring it back to yellow and some of the red to maybe not lighten it up so much. All right. So now it's like I'm, I'm sitting with a color. This is going to feel really different than that, but see how like how much more chromatic I'm like asserting that color to start. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easier to start here and then like you can always dull something down and we wanna often go to like something like this. But my thought is first is that it's like, let's work with just color. Then if we have to lighten something up, we can lighten it up. If we have to, um, shift the color we can shift the color so like in this case it's like if i need it to be more you know more yellow i'll try and add enough to and this is kind of how i hodgepodge my palette together a lot add enough to where i can visibly see a shift okay. and then at that point it's like okay i'll put that down and see how much different that is compared to where I started. Okay. Right. And so I'm going to keep pushing color forward. If I see a blue, if I see a blue in say the shadow of this sphere here, I'm going to start with like a blue that I will find its proper value. So we're either taking some colors and darkening them down or taking other colors and lightening them up with white, but I'm keeping the pigment kind of like clean to start. Then I'll look at it and go, okay, is it that chromatic? I have two options for it to, to dull it down if it is too chromatic. I can dull it down with a a gray of equal value. That's one way to dull it down. Keep it simple, leave it alone. I can dull it down with a complement. I usually brighten up when I get compliments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So in this case, I can I can tone the color down one of two ways. Sticking in the world of color and using complements to bend or slightly break a color 
will give a just a naturally more chromatic tone of that color. If I go in the world of grayscale where I'm introducing neutralizing agents in the form of white and we'll call it black in this chromatic gray, then I can tone it down and it loses some of that chromatic effect, but it still becomes a, a variation of a tone or a mute. Does that make sense? I think so. So if you, you use the word going the color down um, with the gray of the same body, mm -hmm. or um, tone the color down by using the compound. Yeah. Um, what's in the net results? Is there a preference? And why would you choose one method over another? Uh, subtlety of color. So if, so for example, my, so my inclination on this, let me find a visual so example. You're not getting it with one method, you, you, know, yeah. you have a second choice. You have a second choice and I might make discernments in the scheme of like the relationship of a painting, right? right? So in this, in the case of the shadow over here versus say the shadow on the actual blue paper, I would be inclined to treat the shadow on the blue paper more chromatically in the service of allowing me range. So in this case, I've got a blue that's about the right value. If I add the orange to it, it's going to lighten it up. I'm going to naturally kind of like dull down the orange, but keep it. If, if I can train my eye to see that this is an orange and that is also an orange, mm -hmm. right? Just of different qualities. I can minimize the range of change by locking down a value, right? And then from there, I can add <coughs> a, a degree of tone to this blue that will keep things color forward. The second I introduce gray, I'm introducing white, which is ultimately just going to, it's like adding mirrors to add reflection in between the pigment particles to a, a certain extent. So in that same way, now that I have good color there, I have the range to either stick with color um, for, say, that shadow there, or provide an alternative narrative to a descriptor of blue Would you say that, that can then... Eventually, yeah, eventually, yes. In the scheme of Henchy, what he would say is, is it's like if you see a blue, like put a blue down, and like make it as 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 chromatically powerful as possible. So, in the scheme of, if I was to really kind of simplify this mixing process down, it's like start with a color, ideally a signal pigment, but then if I have to modulate it, try and modulate it as simply as possible to get me to blue, green, yellow, orange, what, you know, orange, full stop, you know, anything like that. And then from there, I can bring it down in value. I should, I, should, I can lighten it. Let's say I can lighten it or darken it and then get myself to a chromatic range with that color. And I would probably start there. It's like, that's the, that's the initial read of it. Then if I was to e either mix into it or layer over top of it, I might start to nuance things and say, okay, of a, an equal value and of an equal hue description in terms of it being yellow, orange, blue, green, whatever it is, I need to make this less chromatic and, and I can either lean it in the direction of another color. Um, I can either neutralize it with gray or I can complicate the color by dulling it down with a complement or a split complement or something like that. Um, which is why sometimes you see something where it's like I'm looking at a red wall but I see like hints of green in it. It's like okay that tells me how I can maybe mix that or layer it. Um, practically speaking these exercises are best if you kind of like shy away from the contours of the shapes that you're finding. So you find those simple light and dark shape patterns, those simple color separation patterns where it's like, okay, there's a shape here that also 
is there and it, like that whole shape exists the the far side of that object exists i might even simplify this down towards maybe more like that mm -hmm. um i can i can break this down into very simple light and dark shapes and i can break it down into like yellow paper blue paper red paper blue sheet that kind of thing and if you get those basic contours of light and dark and contours of color descriptors separated you can start by finding like there's an opportunity here for a primary blue a pl primary yellow probably a primary red maybe in something like that i could start by putting those in and i'll kind of creep those up to the edge of my shape but a lot of times that description is going to be some kind of like the edges of things are always going to be tricky descriptors and sometimes they have change and sometimes they have just edge difference. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would creep this color up to there. I would find this color in relationship to that and creep it down to here. And then I'll deal with the edges later, or I might keep them undone in the service of it being like a color shape study. When you're doing a demo, can you like articulate when you're doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. So I figure what we'll do. Oh. Yeah. So what I find um, is helpful for me is to just flatten everything to three dimensions. One hundred percent. One hundred. Yeah. Don't even think about trying to model in it. Where it's like, like squinting at it. It's like, like this shape. Here, let's say like. Let's say like. I'll even dramatize this a little bit more this shape here is going to be just a flat piece of color that I creep the color up to the edges of it but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna join them because I don't I also don't want to creep the color up and then it gets muddy and then it's like oh I think I can fix that and then you know oh, I'll just I'll mix it you know and then it's like you're in that that world of spiral right I can, I can find that shape, I can find this shape, I can find the shape around it. And if you just kind of start putting those puzzle pieces in place, where it's like, in the world of painting, in the world of art making, it's like, avoid the BS of like, do the hard things to make your day easier. It's like, do the easy thing, the super easy thing, find another super easy thing that you can do off of that, get a couple of super easy things to do a medium thing, couple medium things will make the hard thing easy. Like that's how art is done. <laughs> yeah. What? It's like building a building. You wouldn't start with the decorative motifs or whatever carved out. You need to have this the structure of the building. It's, to to it's to yeah. It's totally like the, 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 cause we do have that mindset where it's like, if I could get through this, then it's easy street. And in art, like the this becomes like people want to focus on fingernails or eyelashes or windows and buildings, and they don't even have the damn street drawn, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it's so it's like you 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 build your process up to the to the opportunity that those things that seem really hard almost become inevitable because you've just done you found a really simple color. You made a color relationship, just like these two blues. It's like I can make that color relationship. If I can find this and I can find that, I can probably find the light version of that blue and I can probably find the light version of that. I can probably find this off of that. I could probably find this off of all of that. I could probably find this off of, you know, the, you know, I, it's like I can just find the stuff then. But it doesn't, if I can start first with like, well, like something in here is probably like tube yellow, maybe with a touch of red. I'm like, okay. That's easy enough. Like, let's move on. <laughs> you know, simple, simple. All right. This, this is maybe like tube blue in here. And then this is tube blue with white, maybe touch of red, right? <laughs> okay. That's easy enough. I can get those shapes in and it will tell me if I can get these like really simple, um, strong color shapes in, then they will tell me actually how forceful I can get with these grays that I see. You can actually push the grays a lot farther. And that's why when you see like, especially like paintings of like porcelain or stuff like that, and you look at it and it's like, it's like such a colorful painting for a white porcelain bowl. Mm -hmm. It's like that they've, they've keyed in that range. They know exactly how far they can keep pushing that color 
until it actually is reading as outrageous. And usually it's like if you can get this value description set up, it's like it's going to be hard to make it outrageous. If you can get the like the color shift in that value range, that kind of like temperature leaning or color leaning to happen in that value range, then it really, you know, grass can be pink, sky can be brown. Like It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Grass can be pink because today is pink. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so does that all make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I figure we will get started into this. I gave, I tried to give um, a couple of different options so that you can either focus in on like an object or two. That's probably the the simplest way to go. Does anybody find these any of these objects to just be not fun? And then we'll simplify it even more. But otherwise. You know, finding like finding this or finding that, you know, one of these areas can give you like a good sense of like filling the canvas board with a couple of simple shapes and a couple of simple background colors, finding some light and dark shapes within those. And then we just kind of start mixing the, the, the puzzle pieces together. And it's actually, it's, it's, it's good. And, and even helpful if a majority of that just happens here. And then you, you know, you start mixing a color and you put it down in an area and you go, oh shit. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's try that again. And you can just go from where you were and it's like, okay, that color was not right. It needs to be lighter, more yellow, same chroma, right? It needs to be darker, same color, less chroma. So I, then I can go from there and I, I know how I got there and I can just adjust the mix. Cool? You can use my keyboard if you want to do a demo. Or, or, or was that, I will. Was that, the, was that in the cards? Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in the cards. I actually, okay. I'll probably, I probably. Because I think I, Mary's going to go over there. Oh, Mary's going to go over here? Yeah. Okay. I can. You can just like, just like I got this here for you. You don't have to use my palette. Yeah. Well, and yeah, somebody so, can. I'll move out of the way, and then I'll figure out where I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs>